When it comes to the field of biogeography, islands are the pinnacle of that particular field of study. And the reason why is islands represent the most extreme form of geologic or geographic isolation that we can see. And islands have a very unique and interesting effect on the species that exist on them. In this episode, we're going to talk about the different types of islands and the types of things that we observe on islands and what they tell us about the evolution of species over time. So stay tuned. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about islands. But before we talk about islands, I want you to stop for a second and think about what an island really is. So what is an island? Now I bet every single one of you is picturing a small green little piece of land surrounded by water. I mean, that's fair. I think that's a little bit biased though, because you know, we're humans, right? We we're terrestrial animals. And when we think about islands, we think about land being surrounded by water. But let me ask you, if you're a fish that lives in a pond that's landlocked, isn't that your island? If you're a species of bacteria that can only affect a single species, so you can only survive in humans, aren't humans your island? If you're a species of bird, for example, that really can only survive at high altitudes, isn't that mountain range surrounded by lowlands? your island archipelago now i know that you're thinking like he's being kind of nitpicky right because an island's an island right you're right when we talk about islands we're almost exclusively talking about a piece of land surrounded by water but the point i'm trying to get to you is biologically an island represents something islands represent isolation because that fish that's in that pond is no longer able to interbreed with other fish that aren't in that pond. Those species, those terrestrial species, I should say, that are on that little island in the middle of the ocean are no longer able to interbreed with other species that aren't on that island or members of their species that aren't on that island. And that's the important thing about islands. They represent the most extreme form of geologic isolation. Because quite often, once something finds itself on a true island, that's it. It's isolated for the rest of its existence. Now, in this video, we're going to talk mainly about the traditional context of islands. We're going to talk about land surrounded by water. But we're also going to distinguish between the two major types of islands that we see on this planet, oceanic islands and continental islands. So first, let's start off by defining what those are. Now, there are tens of thousands of islands all over the surface of the Earth. And we can loosely break them down into two major categories, oceanic islands and continental islands. And when we look at oceanic islands, we are talking about islands that are created through geologic activity, such as uh, volcanic eruptions or the formation of coral atolls. In other words, these are islands that are going to be born in the middle of the ocean, completely devoid of life. So, for example, we think about the Hawaiian Islands. They're the result of volcanic activity. And at one point, the, volcanic islands were, or the, the Hawaiian Islands were nothing more than barren, igneous rock piles in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. On the other hand, continental islands, such as Britain, uh, or the British Isles, or Madagascar, they actually existed at once as a part of a continent. And then through some geologic activity, the movement of tectonic plates, for example, they became separated from that continent and became an island. But one of the things we're going to learn is that life on these islands is different in some ways and the same in others. It's mainly going to come down to what types of species we find on these islands. So first, let's start by talking about what oceanic islands look like. So remember that oceanic islands, when they first come into existence, are devoid of life. They are either coral atolls that have died and basically become a rock, or they are the result of volcanic activity and there's just this big lump of igneous rock in the middle of the ocean. In other words, anything that's found living on an oceanic island had to sort of immigrate there from somewhere else. They had to come from somewhere. They weren't just there to begin with. But what's interesting is when we look at oceanic islands, 
no matter which one of the tens of thousands that exist that we pick, they all have something called an imbalanced biota. And what I mean by imbalanced biota is that there's always certain groups of species who are missing. So if we look at oceanic islands, we look at places like the Galapagos or the Hawaiian Islands, for example, we find that those islands are, what well, we find on those islands in terms of species that exist there, they are going to either be birds, plants, insects, and other arthropods, and very rarely the occasional reptile. And that's about it. But in terms of endemic species, on these islands, we never find terrestrial mammals. We never find amphibians or freshwater fish. Why is that the case? Well, let's think about this. Oceanic islands are originally, when they first come into existence, are devoid of life. But why would some species be found on all the oceanic islands and some species never be found on oceanic islands? Well, let's look at the species that exist there. When we think about birds and insects, they can fly. They can travel hundreds or thousands of miles on their own. And if they get into a particularly good wind current or get carried aloft by strong winds or of storms like hurricanes or typhoons, they can travel even farther than that. Spiders, for example, can actually build these cool parachutes out of the silk they use to make their webs. And they can have been known to travel uh, hundreds or thousands of miles in the upper atmosphere to just land somewhere else. Plants, their seeds can either be carried aloft by the wind, they can be carried along on the sea, things like coconuts, for example, or they can actually be transported in the belly of those birds that made it there and because they were a food source back where that bird came from. In other words, these species are good colonizers. Heck, even some reptiles have been known to raft for hundreds of miles, just on the surface of some floating log. They just kind of float, and then they end up somewhere. It's not common, but it does happen. It's been documented and filmed actually happening after a hurricane in the Caribbean. But look at the species that aren't ever found on oceanic islands. Land mammals, like humans and dogs and buffalo. They're not going to make it. They're not particularly good at swimming. They can't fly like that. So the bottom line is they're just not going to make it from the mainland without drowning. Amphibians also aren't good long-distance travelers. They can't raft very long. They have to be around freshwater sources in order for their skin to stay moist so they can perform cutaneous respiration. Freshwater fish, well, they just can't survive in the salt water, so they're not going to make it across the ocean. In other words, these are not good colonizers. And I must stress that this, is a, this isn't just a theme on some oceanic islands. It's on every one of the tens of thousands of oceanic islands that exist. This pattern of abalanced biota exists on all of these islands. However, we don't see this imbalance on continental islands for the most part. Because on continental islands, when that island is created by cleaving off from the continental landmass it originated from, well, it came stocked with life. It's not like they had this, ooh, abandoned ship moment. The formation of that island occurred over millions of years. So gradually, just over time, that island got farther and farther and farther away till all of a sudden there was just no way for those species to get back to the mainland from which they originally came. And at that point, they're sort of trapped like on this raft of speciation that is this continental island. But we don't see these imbalances because typically when that thing existed as a continent, you're going to have your land mammals and you're going to have your reptiles and your amphibians and the freshwater fish that were in the lakes are going to stay in those lakes as that continent moves away. There's no traveling needed to get there. They were already there in the first place when it was just a continent. And now it's just a piece of the continent that's now floating away from the main continent. So we don't see those imbalances. And again, this is consistent with almost every continental island we, look, island we look at. Now, does that mean species can't travel to continental islands? Sure, they can. But realize that unlike oceanic islands, which are devoid of life, with all of these open ecological niches, continental islands don't have a lot of ecological niches open. 
there are already fully formed ecosystems present, so it becomes a little bit challenging to sort of break into those ecosystems and establish oneself. It's not impossible, it's just more challenging. Now, what's very interesting is we can actually look at something that's sort of in between an oceanic island and a continental island. It's a form of continental island, but what we have to do is go look at what old continental islands look like. So here's what I mean by an old continental island. Great Britain, or the British Isles, are an example of a fairly new continental island. Great Britain's only been around as an island for like the past 10 to 20,000 years. Before that, it was just a peninsula off the coast of France. And then water levels got a little bit higher, the English Channel filled in, and all of a sudden the British Isles were the British Isles and not the British Peninsula. 20,000 or 10,000 years in geologic history or in evolutionary history is literally yesterday. In fact, it's not yesterday, it's five minutes ago. <laughs> so in other words, when we look at the British Isles as a continental island, we're not going to see any major differences between the flora and fauna uh, in the British Isles than the flora and fauna that are in France, Germany, and the rest of Eurasia, right? We're just not, and we wouldn't expect to because all of those things were already in place when the English Channel flooded and filled in. On the other hand, if we look at a thing, like, a place like Madagascar, which has been an island for like 130 years or so, or 130 million years or so, things get a little bit weird. And it's not because things had to travel to Madagascar. It's just because when Madagascar started becoming an island 130 million years ago, that was the age of the dinosaurs. That was like the, like the, the end of the Jurassic, beginning of the Cretaceous period, like dinosaurs running around. T-Rex doesn't even technically exist yet. For a few ten more, for tens of millions of years. In other words, there weren't a lot of things that are around today around back then. We had to go through a whole mass extinction event at one point. Now, the one thing about this is Madagascar started slowly drifting away, and it really wasn't noticeably dis noticeably isolated until about 90 million years ago uh, from the African continent. Um, and then about 60 million or about 50 million years ago or so, India kind of left it in the dust and was like, "Okay, bye." Uh, and left it off the coast of Africa as India sort of made its way and is currently slamming into the Asian continent right now. We talked about this in a previous episode. That's where the Himalayas come from. So Madagascar actually gets really completely isolated about 50 million years ago. But up until that point, it was possible for species to go from Africa to Madagascar. Not with a high frequency, but enough. But Madagascar is actually world-renowned for, uh, for its unique flora and fauna. It really is a continent that's kind of trapped like in 150 million or about 50 million years ago in time. If you want to find a lemur, you got to go to Madagascar. And when you go there, you'll find all the lemurs, like lemurs filling a whole bunch of ecological niches. Now, what's interesting about lemurs is they are actually the most basal or primitive of all primate species. Yes, they are ancestors of ours being primates just like us. But like they're the most ancient of primate species that still currently exists. And the only place we find them is in Madagascar. The interesting thing, it appears that the lemur lineage diverged from that of the rest of primates about 60 million years ago. During the preceding 10 million years, made it over to the continent or made it over to the island of Madagascar and then lived there and stayed there in their own wonderful lemury isolation bliss for the last 50 million years. Main, meanwhile, their cousins back on the mainland ended up getting outcompeted by newer species of primate as well as other species. The other thing that happened as Madagascar slowly drifts away from Africa is it kind of missed the evolution of big cats. So when we look at big cats, we find big cats in almost every rainforest environment, whether it's uh, jaguars in South America, leopards and, and lions in Africa, tigers in Asia. Uh, we see big cats in those environments. Not in Madagascar, and the reason why is big cats aren't that good of swimmers. They couldn't get there, and Madagascar left long before they evolved, tens of millions of years, in fact, before they evolved. And instead, we see a weird mongoose relative known as the fossa hanging out in the trees and being that apex predator over there filling that particular ecological niche. Madagascar also has some unique uh, flora. They have these things called baobab trees. There are only eight known species in the world. Six of them exist only on the, con only on the island of Madagascar. Uh, they have uh, like 170 unique species of palms that are only found on the island of Madagascar and a few hundred species of, of orchids that are only found on the island of Madagascar. In other words, when you look at Madagascar, almost every species on that island is endemic, meaning it's a species found only on that island. Now, what's interesting is that's the case for almost all islands. If you go to an island, you're going to find at least a handful of, if not all, endemic species. 
And the reason why is once those species make it onto those islands, they are reproductively isolated from the remainder of their population. They're going to take their own evolutionary path and evolve into something that exists. But they're not spread across other islands because, again, they're on an island reproductively isolated. And that is why islands are the treasure trove of biogeographical evidence. The main reason why is when you go to islands, you're going to find unique species. And the only and best possible explanation is quite simply these species got isolated there. They evolved in their own reproductive isolation into their own unique species. Now, quite often, something that we see on almost every island is something known as an adaptive radiation. Now, I've mentioned adaptive radiations before in other videos. But to recap what it is, an adaptive radiation occurs when a single founder species or a handful of founder species make it into an environment with lots of open ecological niches. And those species rapidly diversify into a number of very closely related species. And they diversify into various ecological niches. And one of the things that's important about this is most of the time uh, they, they radiate into these niches and they take on very special phenotypic characteristics to adapt to those niches. But to be clear, uh, you end up with animals filling ecological niches that they typically aren't found filling in other particular environments. This is a very common feature on islands. It doesn't happen exclusively on islands, but it happens on almost every island that's in existence. So here's a couple examples of, um, of adaptive radiations. Let's just use a couple examples from the Hawaiian Islands to start. Now, the Hawaiian Islands, if you're unfamiliar with them, is a chain of volcanic islands found in the Pacific Ocean, uh, thousands of miles from the nearest continent. Now, uh, Originally, of course, they formed as just giant lumps of igneous rock from volcanic activity in the middle of the ocean. But over time, life eventually made it there. It's a lush rainforest environment on, across much of the island. It's actually got very diverse biomes uh, for, for its location and its size. But a lot of it is lush tropical rainforest. What's particularly interesting is a lot of the plant species that exist there uh, are known as the Hawaiian silver swords. Uh, the Hawaiian silver swords are an alliance of like 30 different species ranging from small flowering plants up to large, almost like woody trees uh, that are all very, very closely related. Obviously evidence of adaptive radiation. What's interesting is all of these species can tra tra trace their ancestry back to a single species uh, known as the California tarweed. Now the California tarweed is sort of a small, uh, it's a pretty little yellow flowering plant that's found throughout much of um, the Western United States. There's actually a whole uh, family of tarweeds that range up and down the uh, Western coast uh, of North and South America. Um, but specifically, the, all of these silver swords on the island of Hawaii related to the California tarweed. Now, again, the ancestor of all of these silver swords is actually this tiny little flowering plant. But on the, island, the Hawaiian islands, what you actually see is this diversity ranging from small flowering plants uh, to shrubs and bushes all the way up to these large trees, uh, which is very interesting. But what this shows us is what happens when an adaptive radiation occurs. Uh, likely when this particular uh, tarweed actually showed up, um, there wasn't a lot of plants on the island. So without competition, they began to rapidly diversify and start filling all of the ecological niches, those of small flowering plants, those to those of the intermediate sized shrubs, and even some of them getting enough mutations uh, to actually evolve into becoming these large trees uh, that we see today. Now, to be clear, uh, it is a tropical rainforest where these survive. Now, what if uh, trees, um, you know, what if... Um, I don't know, uh, balsa trees wanted to be planted in a Hawaiian rainforest or even kapok trees, uh, th those, those large canopy trees uh, from uh, a South American rainforest want to be planted there. Of course they would grow. In fact, they would probably outcompete the silver swords, which is why we don't do that. It would be a huge problem. We'd outcompete the native species, uh, probably because those trees are much better adapted. But on the islands of Hawaii, those trees weren't present. And uh, again, what we're seeing is, like I talked about in uh, an episode from... Uh, a while back, I talked about that evolution isn't the master of perfection, it's the master of good enough. And these, you know, variations of the silver swords were good enough to fill those ecological niches. They're not perfect, um, but they're good enough. We see the same thing with the Hawaiian honey creepers, which are a, a group of, uh, of dozens of bird species. Uh, these can all actually trace their ancestry back to a finch species uh, that is native to Asia. Uh, but again, closely related, not unlike what we saw with Darwin's finches in the Galapagos. 
Um, we end up with one founder species that it rapidly diversified due to a lack of competition into the available ecological niches. Some of them are nectar eaters, so they behave a lot like um, like hummingbirds. Other ones are insectivores. Some of them eat uh, berries and nuts, and other ones uh, are actually carnivorous and go around eating small prey. So again, we're seeing the, the same thing. And of course, they have uh, bills that are adapted for these various things and body sizes and body shapes and even colorations that help them to camouflage for their own particular environments. Perhaps one of the coolest examples of what happens with islands is actually looking at a continent. So let's look at the continent of Australia. It's pretty okay to think of Australia as just this giant continental island floating around in the uh, Indian and Pacific Oceans all kind of by itself. It got cut loose from Antarctica about 35 million years ago and ever since then it's been kind of floating around. In my previous video I talked about how uh, the marsupials actually made it from South America via the Antarctica land bridge over into Australia. But the thing to realize is this, kind of like what we saw with Madagascar, when Australia got cut loose and became isolated from the remainder of the landmass on the planet, um, it was just stocked with marsupial species. The placental mammals really hadn't made it there in abundance. Placental mammals evolved after marsupials, and there just weren't a large number of placental mammals present on Australia as it kind of became this large continental island floating around. So as a result, uh, the, the, the marsupials rapidly outcompeted the small number of placental mammals that were there and took over the island. Because the continent was so large and had so many ecological niches, we see this massive radiation, perhaps the greatest massive radiation that we can actually point to on the planet Earth today, of marsupials evolving into every available ecological niche. And if you look, there's actually, you know, homologues or homologous species, um, placental homologues on pretty much every other continent. But when it comes to the continent of Australia, it's always in the form of marsupials. And that's simply because that was what was there at the time. Again, it's just an adaptive radiation of a group of species. There were uh, some placental mammals there, but there were more uh, There were more marsupials. The marsupials outcompeted and then sort of just evolved into all of those ecological niches. Again, we see treating Australia like an island, it is just a giant adaptive radiation. And that explains why marsupials exist there and with the exception of South America, nowhere else on the planet Earth. But like I mentioned before, whether it's Australia or whether it's one of the tens of thousands of oceanic or continental islands that exist on the planet Earth, most of these islands are going to contain one or if not many endemic species, species that are found on these islands and nowhere else. And that's the thing that's most interesting to uh, biogeographers. Um, they're interested in these because this really is one of the single greatest pieces of evidence we have for evolutionary theory. There really is no logical explanation for why every little tiny island in the middle of the ocean somewhere that nobody can get to. I mean, there's literally one called the inaccessible island, and there are bird species that are called the inaccessible rails that exist there. Why do these individual species exist the way they do? And the answer is so easy to understand if we apply evolutionary theory. It's quite simply species found themselves there, stranded there, and then evolved based on the unique environment that they encountered, the unique selection pressures that they faced on that island. For many bird species, that was the end of their, the, their, end of their evolutionary flight path. In other words, they lost their ability to fly. One of the things we commonly see on these islands are flightless birds. Why? Because there are no natural predators around. There are no reptiles. There are no amphibians. There are no land mammals around to hunt them. And without them, there is no need to maintain flight. Where are they flying anyways? They're on inaccessible island, for crying out loud, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There's just no place for them to go. So the point is this. When we look at biogeography, in particular island biogeography, there really is no plausible explanation other than evolution for why each of these islands has their own unique endemic species that are found nowhere else on the planet Earth. And it's not because that they're specially adapted to exist only on this planet. Because islands are the, the, the places on the planet that are the most fragile. Their ecosystems are the most fragile and the most susceptible to being destroyed by invasive species. We can turn to the Hawaiian Islands for another great example. There are no native land mammals on the Hawaiian Islands. I think they have a few species of endemic bat. But when humans showed up and brought dogs, cats, pigs, mice, rats, they are destroying 
the bird populations on the Hawaiian Islands. They're destroying the native species that exist there because they have no defenses for them. As humans traveled around the globe with their ships and landed on places or inhabited places like New Zealand, which has several dozen species of flightless birds, ranging from the giant moas, which are now extinct, to the kiwi and the flightless parrot known as the kakapo. These species are now endangered or threatened simply because humans arrived and brought with them the species that were never endemic there. They brought with them rats and mice and domesticated cats, for which these birds are now easy prey. The point is this, as I've mentioned numerous times, these species exist the way they do because of random mutations and the selection pressures acted upon them. They're not perfect creations. They're not perfectly adaptive for their environment. And in fact, quite often when something shows up that changes the game, they are rapidly destroyed. If you want an example, look no further than the dodo. The dodo doesn't exist. The dodo got its name the dodo because people thought it was stupid because it wasn't afraid of humans. It had no reason to be afraid of humans or animals because it had never encountered one in its life that threatened it. But all of a sudden, humans showed up, thought they were good to eat or fun to hunt, and all of a sudden, no more dodos. So that was my discussion about islands. I think you can see uh, how important islands are to the field of biogeography. Uh, they are this treasure trove of unique species and being able to look at how uh, unique selection pressures, pressures shape organisms over time, as well as the impact that uh, reproductive isolation has on species. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot and I hope to see you next time. Bye.